Hi, good morning. Welcome to our event. Thank you for joining us. I'm Sarah Sayed with the American Planning Association, Los Angeles. APA Los Angeles champions planning and is a hub for urban policy discussions. We started a COVID committee right after shit hit the fan to address the needs of members in the planning community. This new monthly talk series seeks to bring us together when everything is broken. We found out that today's topic was a top concern for our planning community, which is why we selected this as our first event. I also want to share my personal connection to this topic. I am the daughter of a low income Muslim immigrant. My dad is vulnerable and anxious about how he will get through this. He's been denied resources and his voice is often unheard by the powerful. My dad and others like him are depending on me and all of us to practice our profession with great care and compassion. The choices we make will determine whether we are a healing presence or a harmful presence in the lives of people around us. I am hungry today to learn from the incredible group of women who will lead us in this conversation about power and privilege. The incredible turnout today tells me that you are too, and we thank you for being here. I hope you'll join us again next month for a conversation about finding your career path during uncertain times. This is a monthly series and our next event is June 10th at 10 a.m. Tamika Butler fights racism, inequality, poverty, and injustice. And that's just before breakfast. We recently honored Tamika's commitment to advocacy of those that are less heard and seen with our prestigious Advancing Diversity and Social Change Award. I can think of no better women to lead us in a conversation about power and privilege than Tamika Butler and the women of color she is joined by today. Without further ado, I present Tamika Butler. Thanks so much, Sarah, and thanks APA Los Angeles for having us and, and hosting this conversation. We're super uh, excited to kick off your When Everything Breaks series, and we're gonna try to do it right. Um, we have a dope group of black women here, uh, and I'm just so excited to be uh, reunited with all of them, even from afar. So, you know, I wanna, I wanna kind of give you the game plan for, for what we're gonna talk about today. Um, we're gonna talk about what brought the four of us together and how we all kind of got into this power and privilege framework. Um, we're gonna talk about what motivates us personally because too often we just go straight to the work, not why we're doing the work. And then we're gonna end with how you can do the work and really break down how we think folks should be confronting power and privilege and all that they do. And we hope to leave ample time for Q&A. We really do, but sometimes the four of us get to talking and we all know what happens, um, but we really, are gonna try to leave that time for Q&A. Um, and so what did bring us all together? Uh, in 2018, I believe it was, in the fall, we all from our respective spots, um, you know, we span the country, East Coast, uh, down South, West Coast, uh, and, and Midwest, Columbus, Ohio represent with that. Uh, and we, we got on a plane and we all went to Austria. And we didn't really know each other. Some of us knew of each other, but we didn't really know of each other before we got there. And there was this awesome program, Salzburg Global, uh, that, that brings people together on different topics. And our topic, as you can see from the slides, was building healthy, um, equitable communities. And we were really talking about the role of inclusive urban development and investment. And what was so awesome is that Salzburg partnered with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And so you see one of our sheroes in that picture, uh, Sharon from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. She was really in charge of coming 
up with the idea of who she was going to get in the room from the United States. The room was full of people from Asia, um, from New Zealand, from, you know, all over, for all a ton of European countries. But Sharon really had her hands all over the um, United States delegation. And we were just privileged to be able to be in conversations with folks from South America who had a different perspective. Um, you know, folks who were in places that some of us had never been, but we we found something shared, right? Um, and so when we're talking about the experience, excuse me, the experience of race in America, we could have a conversation with someone from South Africa who had a totally different experience, but still oftentimes feel kinship as we were trying to talk about building these healthy, equitable communities. When I say Sharon was one of our sheroes, it's because she saw and she believed in women of color and in particular in black women. And she made sure a lot of us were in the room. And folks who have heard me speak before know I say, if the world is ending, which these days sometimes it seems like, you should find a woman of color and you should stick with her because she's gonna be all right. We always find a way, we always figure things out. And, and Sharon and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation had that belief in us. And so in addition to taking in these scenic views, we got to have real conversations. And what was so cool is it was urban planning professionals, but it was a ton of public health folks. Vedette's background, and you'll hear her speak a little later, is in public health. And so without realizing it in 2018, we had urban you know, planners and folks who cared about built environment in the same place as public health folks. And we were talking about a framework that we may not have known um, was ready for this moment, um, but it is ready for this moment. And hopefully as, as we go through it, you'll see what we mean. And so I really wanna make sure I'm not talking that much throughout this. I wanna, um, you know, I want to make sure that that you all hear from the folks who I have come to respect uh, so much. Uh, we have short short bios here of ourselves on on this slide, and and what you'll see is just things that really matter to us. Um, you know, my mom always used to tell me, like many black moms told their daughters, you only got to do two things: stay black and die. And so, in everything I do. Uh, I'm just trying to, to stay black, stay honest, and really fight for justice. And I think I'm so happy to share this webinar with other folks who I know are committed to the same thing. Before I pass off to these three, I just do wanna um, shout out the defense crew, the last picture you see and the picture you saw on that last slide. These three are the authors of the framework we're gonna talk about. But this group you see in this picture, we were all working on it, right? We had a white dude from the Netherlands who was like, I don't know how this applies. And then we got in a deep conversation about colonialism and the slave trade. And he was right in there with us coming up with how to com confront power and privilege. And this group in particular, why did we call ourselves the defense crew? Because when people talk about equity, which has become this buzzword that for so many of us is starting to be a little grating, they always show that damn picture of people looking over a fence. And our group came together and said, you know, screw the fence. We don't, we don't want the fence. We want to tear down the fence. This is about defending our communities. This is about a revolution. And this is about completely taking down the fence and wondering why it's even there in the first place. And so that's really um, what we brought to this work. And with that, I want to give each of you an opportunity to just introduce yourself and, and tell us a little bit about that experience at Salzburg that brought us together, in your opinion, and, and helped us um, form what we formed. And so we'll start with you, Escala. All right. Good morning, everybody, uh, or good afternoon, because I'm actually in Washington, D.C. Um, so uh, I, uh, my background, uh, I grew up in, in D.C., right outside of D.C., and um, have spent my work really interested in uh, the way that our places are built and how decisions about the way that our communities are made. And um, that work has taken a lot of space in the housing and community development field. I'm really interested in how housing and how community building and uh, social connections all lead to uh, more equitable places. And I'd say um, that the experience in Salzburg was very formative and it was um, 
powerful. I was definitely um, felt like a fish out of water uh, when we got there and get you get off of a plane and walk into a palace in Austria and um, that is gorgeous and uh, have no idea um, what uh, I had no idea what I was walking into. And I think the fish out of water was really um, uh, a thing. I was definitely felt uh, at times that I was that, you know, flopping, flailing. <laughs> and um, and also uh, it was really powerful because it was this chance to really um, see things differently, um, being in that international context and being in, um, having the opportunity to really see what um, things that I had taken as a given uh, in the environment that I came from, uh, that you really needed to have a light shown on uh, and be made more visible. And probably the most powerful thing to come out of that experience is the connection um, with those uh, here today and others, um, because I think definitely found uh, a group and a tribe that is really working um, towards some change. And that's a gift to have a chance to be a part of. Thanks, Escala. Odetta? Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Um, greetings from Atlanta. Uh, holding down the Southeast region for this conversation. Um, I am a, the managing director for a collaborative called the Transformation Alliance here, which looks to strengthen communities through transit, but my background is all in affordable housing as well and community development. And uh, it's all the same room, you might come to it through a different door, but you pretty much quickly find yourself noticing all of the intersections um, of, of our topic areas. Uh, one of our big partners in the Transformation Alliance and how I got introduced to Tamika is a funding program called the SPARC, Strong, Prosperous, and Resilient Communities Challenge. And uh, they've really asked us to explore the intersections of race, climate, and health. And uh, probably, you know, pretty early on started to really understand that there's there aren't co-equal lenses. There's one lens of race or one con construct of race through which we are you know, ref refracts into all of these different disparities that we're all concerned with. So the core and the, the root of it all is um, this kind of disease of thinking called race. And, um, uh, but in 2018, I was very new to this role and it's my first time in this kind of, in this title, this position of managing director. And to receive the invite to go to this seminar was just like amazing, right? I felt so super validated, like individually as a leader, I was like, oh yes. Uh, because I came in with a lot of nerves. And so it was really nice to get this sort of invitation and this kind of early uh, sort of tap on the shoulder that things were cool. So I arrived in Salzburg, like ready to just like have this amazing kind of individual experience. And what was I going to say after? And what was I going to do later? And how was I? It was a very self-centered thing I brought into the, into the experience, to be honest. And then um, that first night, the first day, we, we got into some conversations, right? We, our, our cohort presented some perspectives, shall we say, uh, that were um, hurtful or harming. And we just, I mean, boom. And I, there was a part of me that was like, no, 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 don't go there. We're here for, we're here for our individual experience. And there was another part that was like, that, this can't be happening. You know, I, I can't watch Tamika, Vedette, Veronica. Like I was seeing all, you know, uh-uh. And so for me, the, the global, now that I look back on it two years later, Salzburg was actually the start of me repudiating, right? <laughs> Frankly, a lot of lifetime training about get your credential, get your resume build up, get your path going. It was my, I took the other road, right? Which was like get in solidarity, um, hand over the experience you thought you were going to have to the one you need to have. And I just kind of jumped into that train car and was just like sitting like right in between whoever else was next to me to talk about all of these things around power. And also I was so glad we ended up on this topic because even that early on, I was starting to get this niggling feeling that we were we were working in the same kind of you know pathways and we were not actually gonna change things if we were not getting further into the, the root of the systems change we needed. And um, when I kind of looked around, like Tamika was already there. So I just kind of, I went at Tamika and um you know got into a really amazing conversation so that's that's me thank you ma'am and vedette bring us home 
All right. Hey, good afternoon, everyone from uh, Buckeye Nation in Columbus, Ohio. Um, they laugh because I go hard for Ohio. People don't, but it's a great place. Um, so I am, am so thrilled to be here with my sisters today. Um, I am an organizer and researcher. Um, I focus on engaged research, um, and I deeply believe um, in our work for healthy and equitable communities, we have to have um, a different standard for what we call success and, and the information that we use to get there um, and the way that we diagnose problems, right? Um, because those things set out our goals and our and our paths to get there. Um, and so, you know, I've done a, a lot of research with and for um, communities um, who focus on changing environments to support their health and well-being from the ground up. Um, and I currently lead a study with uh, an amazing colleague, Mariana Arcaya at MIT, called the Healthy Neighborhood Study, which is really looking at the ways that neighborhood change and gentrification impact the well-being of residents who were already there, which is in, in a completely overlooked um, part of the research. So um, being really deep into measurement and being you know, a, a lifetime public health practitioner, we are obsessed with data and the frameworks that we use to explain that data um, and the evidence behind all of the things. And so headed into Salzburg, I was prepared for like the global summit of the data mines, you know, like the people behind the HIAs and the people behind the environmental impact assessments and all the frameworks that we use are, you know, the global dashboards for happiness and well-being. And so, you know, I was really going there thinking this is going to be a week-long conversation about why we measure, what we measure, how we measure, who pays for the measure, then what happens to the measure, how do we track the measure, should the measure be the same measure over time, kind of all that stuff. And I was so refreshed um, to walk into the room and, and see Sharon and meet these ladies and have people talking about a different vision for the future that didn't involve counting boxes or calculating the size of the box, um, or calculating the, the extension of vision that you would get once you could see over the fence, or the effect of the box's emotions on the person who's standing on it, and really just kind of said, what if we didn't have to measure any of that? Because we focused our energy on dismantling the fence. And so I knew that these folks um, were my tribe and really appreciated the conversation then around like, um, how do we get more people to look at the fence as the problem? And that's kind of what has kept us connected, I think, around this work and advancing this, this framework since our days at Salzburg. So I'm excited to get into it. Great. Thanks, everyone. And so, you know, I, I do want you all to talk a little bit about why you do this work. As, as we were prepping for this, um, actually, before we even knew we were prepping for this, we were just having a catch up call. And we were just all catching up on what was going on in life. Um, you know, three of us are parents, like how our kids were driving us crazy, um, what was going on in our jobs, uh, how, how, you know, the world was impacting us as, as Black women. And, and, and then, you know, we started talking about um, Brother Ahmad, who, who had been, you know, out there running and just lynched. And uh, Odetta sent this late night email one night that was like, yo, we do this because we're fighting for our humanity, right? And 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 we're just we're just fighting for our for our future, for our kids, right? And and we're having this really deep conversation about how heavy it was. And all of us and all of our work are in deep coalition with other um, and, you know, indigenous communities, black communities, um, folks with disability, like we all see the intersectional lenses of, of the work we do, but at the end of the day, we're black, right? And, and that is so true to our experience. And so for some people, they're thinking about a bike lane, or they're thinking about um, a slower street, or they're thinking about, you know, a zoning to, to change who can live where and density. And like, at the end of the day, we all have moms in our head that are like, you gotta stay black and you gotta die. Like those are the only things you gotta do, right? And part of being the only thing you gotta do is constantly thinking about the experience of our people and how we have been oppressed and how we have been hurt and how in every piece of work and project and funding and idea we have, we're still thinking about how to get free. We're, thinking, we're still thinking about how to bring people together, but for people to see 
our humanity. And so we started this, this email conversation and we decided that when we did this, we wanted to share with all of you part of why we do the work we do. Um, and so, um, you know, Ascala, I'll let you, you start on this one. Thanks. Um, so I couldn't fit in this frame, like this picture goes on with more people and more people. And I've been really fortunate that I um, come from a very, uh, very large and very diverse family. And, um, and that this raised with this notion of the family boundary was was not was pretty pretty loose so you know pretty much you know as a kid uh almost anyone i met was family which was really confusing as a kid but uh really important i think to how um my understanding of our connection um with each other and how um how much uh why i do it is for my little ones, uh, for those that came before me, for those I haven't met yet, for myself. And I think that, um, you know, I grew up also um, here outside DC and was very, um, it was very clear uh, always and what the impact of where I, where I lived, um, the impact of race, the different experiences uh, that people have because of place and race, and I um, really uh, have set about wanting to do something about that. And um, and I think this piece on how to be free is is it. And it's, it's this um, desire for a freedom that is, um, that our structures and our systems actually work in, in our interest. Uh, and that we as individuals, that we're free within to actually uh, thrive and to be um, be our fullest selves um, individually and together. With that. So um, this, this is a picture of my grandfather and my sister and I. Um, I have the, you know, kind of scrunched up face because we are on the top stank of stone face. mountain i have the stank face so we're on top of stone mountain in georgia um part of my stank face was like did you really make me walk all the way up here when we could have just took the little sky ride thing but the other piece of um why i love this photo is um my grandfather was an organizer and an evangelist and part of what he did was to integrate lutheran churches in america and a piece of that was really um, connecting neighborhoods, right? And so having these old legacy churches, um, German speaking kind of Lutheran churches in what were now, you know, 98% black low income neighborhoods and understanding that the opportunities that those families and children needed just to eat, to uh, get from one place to another, to be safe, to have clean air, to have water. Those became the issues that the, the church and the beloved community had to address because none of those amenities and resources were there, right? And and going around with him at this age, you know, he would drag us around, we would door knock, we would sign people up for things. You know, I had to constantly sit at the community organizing meetings and sit there and go like, what are you talking about? Why do I have to hand people water while they're waiting for voting? Like, ah, oh, this is so terrible. But really, I do this work because it's in my blood and it's a legacy piece for my family, right? These are things that I value and deeply care about. Um, I think about this speech from MLK, you know, I've seen the mountaintop speech, which came at kind of the end of his journey in his, uh, you know, later years when he began to be weary, but he said, I may not make it there with you, right? But I know that you'll carry it on. And so that piece, really motivates me. Um, and I, I came to find out later after I got into public health, which I felt like was the perfect vehicle for justice, right? It's the place where you can uplift inequities and pinpoint disparities by race and cause systems to change in order to correct them. I found out way later in my practice of public health, I found a book that my grandfather wrote when I was about five, and it was about the maternal child health crisis in black communities. And we are just now trying to stand up 
infrastructure to deal with the same thing today. And so a piece, the, the motivating energy for this is really this, the same things we were fighting for 50, 40, 30 years ago are the exact same things that we're fighting for now. And we need to do something radically different. And so that's why I come to this work with kind of all of my energy and as a part of the beloved community. Thanks for that. Odetta? Um, okay, so uh, this is this is my crew, right? My husband and our two kids. And I want to point out, first of all, this was April 4th. This was the day that we that I acknowledged the passing of the one and only Prince. So I had put on my purple shirt and um, without asking, they put on purple shirts to be in solidarity with me. So I had to get the picture. Um, and uh, I often say when I talk about why I do what I do, that um, I want these three people to be everything they want to be and everything they're supposed to be in this world without fear of physical harm or death. And I say those words deliberately and we're saying them um, in a time where um, that is uh, a real outcome. My son is 12 and a half and he is the tallest person in the household. And uh, I think when Tamir Rice was shot was when I really get real for me that um, my son, as he grew and came into his manhood, even if he's 12, 13, 14, is going to be perceived as a dangerous person. My husband, who is a very gentle, educated, uh, thoughtful person, self-regulates his behavior around white women in public so that they will uh, uh, not perceive of him as a, a threat. And it's just so antithetical to who he actually is that it always pisses me off. And then I look at my daughter and she's so full of life and um, so sort of kind and kind of naturally um, empathetic. And I just think like the world needs what they have to offer. And if I extrapolate from my crew over and over a million times, there are so many gifts that the world needs that our current structures are strangling literally killing, slowly killing. Um, and I sometimes say too, what if the cure for the cancer that's gonna strike me down or strike down someone I love is locked up in the head of a kid who uh, can't get AP chemistry, right? Because they happen to live in a certain neighborhood or don't have some kind of access that they should have. Like we're losing out if we don't, if we don't work this through. And to Vedette's point, it's been decades, right? This is not an awareness problem anymore. We know, what's happening and uh, we have got to, so I feel like, you know, in the life cycle of working in this kind of stuff, you come in, you know, guns blazing, I've got to change things and then a point might come where you're like, okay, we might actually be working towards my grandchildren's lives as opposed to my life or my children's life. But whatever that trajectory is, I'm here to do a piece of it and it's gotta be done. And the sort of perpetual engine that I tap into like on a daily basis is to look at these three faces and know all that they are and have to offer. And I want a world where they, they can do that. Great. Anything anybody wants to add or anything that came up to mind before we jump into the, the framework? All right. And so I know a lot of you, um, you know, have, have seen tweets or maybe heard whispers of, of this framework and we've even referred to it here, um, but we wanna talk a little bit about how, how folks can actually think about approaching this work of confronting power and privilege. Before we do that, we want to just a quick check in, um, make sure folks are still with us. But when you think about this work, and some of you may refer to it as equity work, some of you may refer to it as transportation justice work, um, however you refer to this work that made you get on this call today, um, we just want to check in, launch a poll, and, and see like where you're at, how you're feeling um, before we get into the weeds of it. So can we launch that poll? So if everybody could just uh let us know where you currently uh where you're currently at here looks like folks are responding we're going to close in about 10 seconds so get those last responses in five seconds all right Great. 
Okay. So we're we're kind of we're kind of all over, <laughs> which is is I think where a lot of people uh, are these days, right? Um, I I you know some of us want to burn it down, some of us are feeling brave, um, but let let us kind of share with you um, kind of how we think wherever you are, you can channel uh, you can channel this energy and you can move yourself towards really. Um, having a real honest discussion in your work about power and privilege. And I think something that I think something that we have all thought about as we've done uh, this work, I said it before, we we think the fence is the problem, right? Like we're trying to tear down that fence and and really get at power and privilege. Um, and so often you come to these kind of talks and you folks like us, and then you're like inspired and you're like, but what do I do? And that's always a frustrating question. One of one of the things we talked about in prepping for this was, should we take the framework and run people through an example? But this is this is an unpaid labor of love that we're all doing for one another. And at the end of the day, folks of color can't always do the work for you. And so, you know, rather than just giving you the fish, we're gonna try to talk you through um, how you actually catch that fish. And if you look in the GoToWebinar kind of interface, you'll see there is a handout and a hand, the handout walks you through this in a little bit more detail, but we're just gonna take it step by step. When we got together in Austria, we all said, and we said, if you really wanted to do this, if, if you didn't just say, I care about equity, but you really, really wanted to do it, um, how would you walk yourself, no matter what your project, transportation, health, how would you walk yourself through it? And what are the questions and things you should ask? And, and how do you even get in the space to that? And so these are the three steps uh, we came up with and Ascala is gonna start. Thanks. So starting with actually creating or seeking out brave spaces, um, this is really how we think about what are the conditions that are needed for change and what do we have to do to foster and to create these conditions. And it comes out of this recognition that the um, systems and structures in which we operate uh, keep us working towards outcomes that are not in the interest of people of color and that are not in the interest of for any of us and um, that that is in spite of um, a lot of intention a lot of people that uh, that decide to take professional paths and personal paths that are really about helping others and that are really interested, um, that, that feel called um, for a lot of different reasons to go to work, um, to become a planner, to become a, a transportation advocate. And yet um, we find ourselves doing work that, uh, that keeps having, keeps us seeing the same outcomes, the same disparities and the same inequalities. And so um, what we offer is this idea that, that really it starts by recognizing that whenever we show up in our work, we're showing up with multiple identities, we're showing up uh, as individuals, we're showing up in our role and we're showing up in our system. So it's like this idea of this person, role and system and that the systems we're in definitely um, don't really recognize us as individuals that, that, that are really operate and thrive um, with by stripping the personal out and really holding at best, maybe holding our roles uh, as central and even obscuring what the system looks like. Because I think, you know, that fence, we don't necessarily see that fence, even though it is there. And, um, and so creating brave space asks us to, to really bring our full selves in. And I think that there's a lot of, um, I think we've all been in meetings where we have started with agreements. We've started even, you know, with this notion of um, a lot of work around inclusion um, often talks about this idea of safe spaces. And I think um, we uh, really clearly, um, uh, felt important to recognize that there are no safe spaces, that when you sh walk into a space and your identity is other than that of the dominant culture and dominant norms, there's, it is not safe. And in spite of that, we need to show up and we need to be brave. Um, and so 
um, some of the conditions that uh, are in our that we think about and the way that we foster that gray space is really the personal. Yeah, this is happening. <laughs> this this is real life. <laughs> okay. Um. So. Uh, yeah, so this is my person <laughs> and this is me as a person and that what we I think just really quickly to and then we can move on. Um, that to be able to actually connect. So when we think about space, it's our connections and our relationships with each other. And so if you look at the principles, we really think about what is that work as us as individuals that has us be able to say, you know what, um, I um, understand myself and I understand that I have biases and I have mo mental models and I have ways that I operate in this world because I have a whole host of experiences and that they matter to the way that I do my work and they matter to the way that I show up every day. And that I also see that in you. I see that in you as my colleague. I see you that in, as my boss, as someone I manage, and also as us as a group working towards something. And so, um, so if you'll notice that if you run through the Brave Space principles, there, there's this like reciprocity in them. There's this, this work that we do in ourselves and there's this, this um, work that we need to extend to others and that we need to accept from others uh, in order to, um, to really uh, bring about the courage to actually do something different. Um, and I think that, you know, would offer that it's really important that, that um, these principles be made visible, that they're, you know, that they are something that we name so that we can hold accountability with each other, that we can um, say, you know, this is actually not in alignment. We desire to actually speak our truth and to hear your truth. And what just happened in that meeting didn't allow my truth. And so that we have this way and this language um, by having actual principles that and things that we in agreements that we can hold accountability for self and others. And then I think um, finally, it's really thinking about space is not, um, I think a lot of times we think of space as just uh, the, the big group meeting and it's, um, or that we have agreements when we start our conversations about equity with the equity committee. And that's not, that's not it. It's really every space that we're in um, because this, I, the change that will happen will not come um, from, it, it will start in our individual relationships and it will start in the trust um, that we have with each other. Thank you, Escola. Eldon, real MVP, <laughs> all parents. Um, let's talk about understanding the role that power plays um, in, in the work, Vedette. Cool. So I, I think picking up where es Escola left off, right, um, we have spaces that we, we occupy and that we create together um, and that everywhere that we work and everywhere that we show up is a space. Um, and through the way that we show up, we determine in our practice whether resources do or do not flow into communities, right, and how that happens. And that is what we conceive of as the result of our individual and collective power. And so as we were kind of thinking about looking at that picture of all the children at the fence, how do we move from metaphor, right, how do we move from an image to helping people be able to identify the fence in their own work. Be you a, a multimodal transit planner, be, be you a person who is setting the transportation budget for the state, be you a public health practitioner that is trying to balance the trade-offs between physical activity, green space, and high density development, right? Um, but how do we make it that clear so that people can understand 
the, the structure that people are being forced to see over? What is it that we're all programming around, right? Um, and, and for those purposes, we kind of adopted a definition of power, which you'll see in the handout, as uh, the ability to direct laws, policies, and investment that shape people's lives. Um, when we were particularly thinking about the role and power of the role of power in building healthy and equitable communities. But I think writ large, back to what Odetta kind of shared about why she shows up, it's about the ability to achieve purpose, right? And so when we think about that, what purpose have we uh, gathered around the table to achieve? What purpose did I draft this memo to achieve? You know, and so we're in those are all things that can help us identify the fence. And so when we got into that deep conversation about how do we help people see this, the fence and help them see why it's necessary to remove it, we got into thinking about, well, while stacking boxes may bring you to parity with others, that's already a predetermined end that someone set for you. And when we really think about equity, it's like, what if I wanted to get in the game? What if I wanted to be the team manager? What if I wanted to sell peanuts in the stand? What if I wanted to own the ball club, right? Like, how do we, it's the ability to achieve our own purpose and contribute what we have to the world, to our families, to ourselves. And so, you know, we really kind of gathered around this idea of, of self-determination and thought about the fence is really the barriers that are erected for cer certain groups of people because of who they are, because of their heritage, because of their skin color, because of the language they speak, because of their nationality. Um, and it's those structural barriers that keep people from being able to contribute what they have. And so how do we help people to identify the structural barrier, right? Fences are structural. Um, and, and so what do I mean by like structures? I mean, structures like redlining and home lending policies, right? That we see in our work. Structures like educational funding and tax policy. Structures like environmental regulations or lack thereof. Structures like racism, structures like, um, funding mechanisms for real estate developers or uh, protections or lack thereof for renters and homeowners, right? Uh, where we choose to, choose to build freeways and stadiums and the agreements that they do or do not have with communities, those are all structures. And those are all in place because people come together to do work, right? Structures are just the result of groups of people coming together to do work. And so um, when we thought about you know, helping people to see them, we kind of like had to step back and say, well, why is it a thing, right? Everyone knows that racism is a thing. You may not believe what its impacts are, but it's a thing, you've heard of it. You've seen it in history, right? People know that there are inequalities in education. You can point out a poor performing school. You can point out a well performing school. People can look at a zoning map and see that there was redlining. So why are we having such trouble identifying what the fences are that we need to tear down? And one of the things that we really discuss with our global partners is like, well, these fences are erected and reinforced by our roles and the functions that we play in decision-making and creating opportunity, and that a lot of those are rooted in our norms. They are like the water that we swim in. They're obvious, but they become so normal that we don't question them. They're things that we don't think we can dismantle. They're things that we don't necessarily think should be dismantled, right? And those are the very things that we're trying to get people to see. And so we kind of had this joke at the time. This was uh, during the Oscars um, where Viola Davis was uh, nominated for her role in Fences. And then um, the whole cast from Hidden Figures was nominated. And the announcer, you know, asked Pharrell, oh, you're nominated for Hidden Fences, which is not a movie. Um, but it was like all the Black movies combined because they're all the same, even though they're not. But so we got to talking about hidden fences. They're hidden in plain sight. And so what we tried to do with the power section was to evoke a list of questions that would help people be able to see the fence, see the normal processes and structures in our everyday thinking and the way that we approach work that perpetuate these imbalances of power. And in order to get to equity, we have to be able to do that. And so some of our questions were really to help 
normalize the practice of discussing and analyzing power, right? There was a time in which planners didn't know what social determinants were, but we're not in that day, right? And we think that in the future, in order to get to equity, we all need to be able to understand and have conversations about power the same way we do social determinants, right? And so we wanted to offer a series of questions that would normalize that practice, that were not super technical. You didn't need to have like a point data estimate from this dashboard to be able to do it, but you can do it individually and you can do it collectively. And so um, it means looking at why things happen, how things change or how they stay the same. And some of the questions are things about like, you know, who benefits from this problem not being solved? Who's always okay, right? And who, despite our best efforts and even uh, incremental gains, continues to be disadvantaged? Um, it means asking about things um, like, what facts do we use? Since we have a demand for data, which sources of data are valid? And where does our data not agree with societal experience, right? Like we see that today around things like gentrification or urban development. We have people rallying in the street and laying their bodies down saying, this is not a good process for me. And then we have all of our smart growth data that says, look how many more bike lanes we have. Look at this high density, look at the, you know, look at on the average, the incomes have gone up, you know, um, the educational rates have gone up, but then you have a whole swath of people who are screaming saying, this is not good for me. So what do we choose to rely on when our way of assessing information doesn't agree with what people say that they need? Um, and then connecting to what Ascala laid out, we need brave space because even when we answer those questions collectively around the table as colleagues, we then have to be brave enough to answer those questions of ourselves, right? In my role and in my life, what? how do I benefit or how am I disadvantaged from this problem being solved or not solved, right? When, what am I afraid to lose? And when you answer that question, maybe you'll realize it's something like, I'm afraid to push this because I know I'll be reprimanded at work. And then you've identified offense. There's a norm in your organization that upholds, right? Um, the ability to shy away from pushing back against power. Or maybe you'll lose hold of your own personal belief system and you, you discover power holds around the isms in your life, racism or sexism or classism. Um, and so these questions are really uh, aimed at making this progress, this process systematic and institutional and personal. Thanks for that. And Odetta, um, why don't you wrap us up? Uh, we have about 10 minutes left, but really talk to us about how we analyze and challenge privilege. Great, um, happy to do that. And so it's the final step, but it culminates, I think, some things you can starting to catch the threads, right? Um, the first is self-examination and that systems change is actually a personal transformation um, that everybody should be tackling and going through. And so that includes acknowledging where you hold privilege in your life. Uh, you may not feel powerful, you may not feel privileged, but if you stop and uh, commit to really thinking about, are you able-bodied, um, are you heterosexual? Are you a uh, Christian? Like what are the areas in your life that feel uh, somehow innate to you, but in fact, the power structures have uh, told you that that gives you a privilege. Um, when you list out the privileges, what are the things that maybe your race, uh, your gender, your choice of who to love actually undercuts any other space where you might hold a higher bit of privilege? You, you really gotta analyze who you are and get a hold of, um, how privilege is working in your life and in your thinking and what you think are norms are actually, um, what you think is innate and natural is actually something that's been delivered to you um, to help you somehow construct a place in the world. And we know too that when power and privilege um, are challenged, right, uh, that they are durable and flexible and adaptable. And so what I was excited about particularly in this whole framework, um, in addition to the commitment to personal transformation and not letting folks get away with not checking on themselves, was this idea, this acknowledgement that um, that question about who who stays the same, who who wants things to stay the same, who benefits from change or not change. That's where the privilege often uh, shows its results. Privilege has accrued a power and resource to itself in a way that it can see what is being demanded in the way of change and adapt. Uh, 
change the language. I think Karl Rove recently described President Obama's um, calling out of the COVID response as a political drive-by shooting. So people are adopting language and repurposing it for their own, uh, their own narratives in ways that are like deeply problematic, right? So the, the, the third step starts with analyzing your own privilege, thinking about how it plays out in your life, and the cycles and actions that we repeat regardless of outcome, right? You're just in that, that very well-worn path. And then let's start really thinking about uh, how we get ahead of what privilege will do to protect itself. Who's blamed for conflict when there's a narrative talking about the challenge? Who's sacrificed to resolve the conflict? We're having a very serious discussion about that now as a society and these essential workers who previously were considered troublesome parts of society, but now they're essential. And it's okay for us to all get out of our houses and do whatever because the people who will have to um, work on our nails or uh, uh, you know, line our grocery shelves are somehow, you know, it's okay for them to have been coming out and, and exposing themselves. Um, check for the patterns. And once you sort of resolve a problem, who gets to go back to the way things were? Who actually is not changed? Whose positions and status is not changed? And who happens to restore things to the way they were before the conflict? That's also a, a signal, right? So we're trying to offer some uh, red flags that you can note if you realize that the same person who was uh, thriving and doing well before the change is exactly the same person as after the change. I'm not saying you came up with a bad idea, you might want to um, go back and look again at whether or not they have kind of gamed the new system to uh, continue their privilege. So we just wanted, to, I think, in this step to particularly end on acknowledging that power holds itself, right, and will defend itself, and that we shouldn't get too self-congratulatory if we make a change. We have to keep doing the analysis, and that's where kind of the head and the heart come together. You got to check yourself and do the analysis on the, on the um, program itself. Thanks to you three for really wrapping up uh, so much we all put into that, so much um, that we could, we all know we could talk about it for a very, very long time. Um, we have a couple of minutes left, and so if folks have questions that have gone uh, into the comment box, our real hope is when we did that poll, very few of you said you felt brave. Um, and hopefully there's some, some recognition that to do this work, you, you have to start there. Um, many of us have to be brave every day. And so we just ask for folks to join us in, in this struggle and this fight to, to, do, uh, to do this work. But let's see, um, let's see if we have any questions, if folks have put anything uh, in the chat box. Nothing so far. I guess I will turn it to each of you if you just want to make um any closing remarks um and we can kind of just just go in the same order since odetta just talked give her a little bit of time but ascala any closing remarks you want to share um i think that uh you know one of the things we got as we were working on this framework we got a lot of um like give us an example like show us where's the evidence like where's the um and I think that uh, that was really challenging on a lot of levels uh, to, and, and amazing. Um, and so I think that it, maybe what the like parting thing is like, don't let, uh, you know, the need for the, the concrete data, explicit evidence, um, justification that, maybe that it needs to be exist outside you to to be a reason to to go down this path and to to lean into it and and maybe not even go down so i think plenty of people are on this path and struggling to find allies and um and partners in doing this and um and that it's okay that it be uh that we ha we have emotions and that we be real and that we be connected and uh we have crying kids you know things like that and um, that there's power in that, and uh, we've got to live into that power. Yeah. 
If you I, want I, for that to come in. Yeah, for that, sorry. Okay. Technical. I can also jump in. Um, I, I think another important part about this piece as we kind of sat by that beautiful lake with our um, global colleagues is that, you know, to Asala's point, when we went to kind of publish it, they were like, you need to give us a case study in this format with a specific example and then, you know, responses to each of these questions. But everyone around that lake could answer these questions and had a multitude of examples. So I, I think the challenge is not necessarily like, where does this show up in life? Um, I think anyone who's been doing this work, you think about um, every time you kind of make great gains with something that will be deeply transformational, your organization probably goes into a strategic planning period, right? Or you reorg or something like that, right? So we had all of these um, uh, concrete answers to this from our individual work. So as you work through it, I'm sure um, there will be a lot of examples from your own life and work that populate this. But the other thing about this is that we also envision this, it, it's a personal guide and a guide for your team, but we envision this, particularly for those of us who do engaged work and who work with partners, being a collaborative tool. So there's two sides to the fence, to the fence, right? And so one of the things that often happens is like our perception of what is happening does not agree with mm -hmm. the community's perception of what's happening. And so we envision this being a two-way conversation when you can take this tool to your partners in other agencies, you can take this tool to your partners in community and have them answer the same question, particularly around who benefits and who doesn't from the problem being solved. Also particularly around um, what are the things that restore things to the status quo? Who are the people that are brought in when it's time for something transformational to happen, but as soon as that work is over, that committee is dismantled, that equity plan is done, they're no longer around, right? And so also think about applying this tool with people who are across the fence from you. Great, Odetta? I just want to say I love you guys. I was we excited to do this webinar just because I was like, oh, I get to talk to these people for an hour. And so folks are going to listen in, but it's always so amazing just to hear the three of you speak. Um, I, I had the opportunity uh, just this morning to try and use this frame in thinking about um, um, how to describe when we would know a change has, has occurred in, in, this pro in this specific program. And it got me to thinking a little bit about one of the opportunities of a frame like this is to redefine what a return on investment looks like, right? Um, and so we all know that we, we this, this, this culture would have us put every return on investment in financial or monetary terms. And I think that we have the opportunity to redefine return on investment as, did you have a happier work day because we shifted a process? Uh, did you feel a little fulfilled that maybe you were working on purpose to Vedette's point because you made a change? Like that's a return on investment that feeds productivity, it feeds energy. Like you can eventually define it in some capitalist way if you need to, but I don't think we have enough balance in understanding that um, it just feeding into a person, a human being with these process changes, with, with policy, like that's a return on investment that should be, you know, sought after. We should hunger for that and, and seek that as well. So I'll close on that. Yeah, and you know, I'll just say thank you again to APA Los Angeles for bringing us together. Um, you know, part of part of what what's hard about these virtual things is you don't get to see an audience, and you don't get to see if people are vibing with what you're saying or if it's going well. But I can tell you three that you did an amazing job. I love sharing space with intelligent, thoughtful, and more than anything, caring Black women. Um, who don't just believe in bestowing power upon others, but co-powering others and, and working together. And a lot of folks have asked like, but how do we be brave? How do we be brave? And I think something you've heard from all of us is it starts with you. You, you just gotta do it. You gotta lead by example. You gotta be the one to say, I'm not gonna be the popular one in this meeting. Um, if I say this thing, and I don't know if other people are thinking it, but I'm thinking it and it's wrong, um, and so I'm gonna say something and, and you just have to be that person because I guarantee you, we have all talked about equity spaces we've been in as black women where we just go in and we're like, we're not letting them take our energy today. We are not doing this. We are gonna just sit here quietly because it will hurt too much. And we honestly can't do it because we owe it to our ancestors. We owe it to ourselves. We owe it to our children. And so you each have to wake up every day and realize you owe us. Yeah. and you owe yourself 
And so if you really wanna do this equity work, then you have to get real about what are the fences and you have to get real about confronting power and privilege. And so we hope if you take nothing else with you, you take that. Thank you all for joining us. We had about 250 people the whole time um, engaged. And so, um, you know, thank you three for your time. Thank you, APA Los Angeles. For everybody else, don't forget this is a monthly event and please join APA Los Angeles next month. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Take good care of yourselves. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.